We all have opinions on just about everything, right? On people, on places, on things, on politics, on religion. And from our perspective on these things, we develop our attitude about them, how we feel about them, and how we express how we feel. Sometimes we reveal our attitude in our in our words by what we say. Sometimes we express it by the things we don't say. Maybe a facial expression or our body language. But no matter what our our attitude is, it's either a good attitude or it's a bad attitude. So, the question I have is, what is our attitude towards our brothers and sisters in Christ? What's our attitude toward the leaders in the church? How do we look at them? How do we feel about them? How do we treat them? What's our attitude towards each other? In a letter that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to his good friend and fellow laborer, Timothy, a young man who was a leader in a church, church in Ephesus. When he wrote to to Timothy, he said this in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he, he told them he was writing to him and to the church to tell them how they were to conduct themselves within that fellowship, how they were to pattern their lives, what kind of attitude they were to have with each other. Because Paul pointed out, You, within the church, are the household of God. In fact, he said, you are the church of the living God. Our attitude towards each other is a reflection, really, of our attitude toward God, because the church belongs to him. We are a group, a body of believers who have been brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is the one who has brought us here. He has brought us together to bring glory to him. And so, we who are the true church, Paul continues, are the pillar. We are the support for his truth. So as we function... In the church, as we function together to uphold the word of God, to teach it, to live it, our attitude, our attitude towards each other will be evident as we wait for Christ to return. And what is that attitude? It's our responsibility, isn't it? To safeguard the truth of the word of God, we know that. We are to to uphold it. We are to treat it as treasure, as we teach it, as we live it, as we obey it, as we present it to the world. But it's also our responsibility to guard our tongues, to treat each other with the right attitude. That's the way we uphold the truth of his word. What an awesome responsibility we have been given as his church to represent him here on this earth while we wait for him to come and to take us home. And what will he find? Ephesians 5.27, he is looking to find a bride. He is looking to find a bride who has been set apart to him. A bride who is without stain cleansed, purified, above reproach, worthy of the one who has purchased that bride with his blood. And that is our goal, isn't it? That's that's in our hearts. That's our desire. That's what we want to do as his church. But, you know, even though we belong to Christ, even though we are filled with his word, filled with his spirit, You know, sometimes there are just problems in the church. Difficulties. And why? Well, why is that? Well, the answer is simple, isn't it? We're people. And our flesh 
sometimes gets in our way. And in our weakness, we fail. And we fall. And sometimes the enemy is is more than willing to push us in that direction as he fans the flames of our confusion, of our misunderstanding, of our bad attitude, which is really a rebellious spirit against God. But God is not a God of confusion, is he? No, we read that in, in 1 Corinthians uh Chapter 14, he is not a God of confusion. He is a God of peace. He is a God of harmony. And that should be the attitude that we have. We should reflect him within the church. Within the church, this should be a place of peace and of harmony. So that all things might be done how, he says, in a orderly way in a way that brings glory to God. So, we're to function in the church in unity. Remember, Paul told us that in Ephesians, we are to be like stones, individual stones, set in a building, working together, dependent on each other, working to bring glory to the Lord. And to help us maintain that unity, to help us maintain that perspective, God has done what he has done throughout the history of his people. He has raised up men. Men to lead his church. Men to lead his people. And Acts 20, 28 tells us how those men have been selected. He says they have been selected by the Holy Spirit. It is God who selects men to lead his church, to lead his flock. Leaders, we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 3, who are to serve the Lord as they serve the body of Christ. Men who are devoted to him. Men who are devoted to his work. Men who are devoted to his word. Men of worship. Men of dignity, it says who are above reproach. Men who can serve with a clear conscience, devoted to their wife, devoted to their family, but above all devoted to the Lord. Leaders, Titus tells us in chapter 1 there, who are mature in their faith, mature in their walk with Christ, Those who have a wisdom and a discernment that doesn't come from themselves, but it comes from above. God-given ability to be able to faithfully defend and accurately present and explain the Word of God. Well, Paul tells us, In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, who's adequate for these things? Who's sufficient in themselves to be able to affect people for eternity? To be able to lead those that Christ has died for to carry out this ministry from God? Well, those men who have been truly selected by God will admit and acknowledge that this responsibility and this task is is overwhelming, that it is only by God's grace. It is only through his power, through his ability, through his strength, that this can be done. And that was the task of the leaders in the church of Thessalonica. That is what they faced. And like the believers in that church, these leaders were learning how to lead. They were learning how to lead the flock of God. And so Paul tells them in in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 12 that, that God has called these leaders. 
He has called them out from among them to serve him, to serve God. And he has equipped them for this assignment. He has equipped them for this assignment so that they might help the people to grow. To grow in their relationship with the Lord. It says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 that God raises up leaders who keep watch over our souls. And they will give an account of how faithfully they have done that. So we're not to make their task any more difficult than it is by our disobedience, by our rebelliousness, by our arrogance, by our bad attitude. What will happen, it says there, because it will grieve them. It will grieve their souls. They will groan inside because of us, because of our sin. So Paul says this in verse 12. We request this of you, brethren. Eroteo. We bring this before you for your consideration. That you, brothers and sisters, take the time to learn, to appreciate those who lead you. Oida, in Greek. To know them. To know their heart. To observe their life. To see how, how they handle themselves. To recognize their faithfulness. And then, once you see that, to value them. To look at them as a, a gift. A precious gift that has been given to you. And given to the body of Christ. Respect those men, he says, who diligently labor among you. Copieo. Those who work to the point of exhaustion, but beyond exhaustion. They expend themselves, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Ekdapaneo. They work to the point where there is nothing left to give. And even though they need to become weary at times, and even though it would be be easier just to quit, to give up, they don't quit. They don't give up. They go on despite the trouble, despite the toil. So Paul says, get to know them. Understand their heart. Understand what it is costing them to serve Christ and to serve you. So, he says, verse 12, willingly, with joy in your heart, place yourself under their authority as you would submit to Christ. Because they have charge over you. Proisthemi. In Greek, they stand before you. They speak on behalf of God. They're his servants. They're his stewards. They have been placed in the church to manage the church, to direct the church. They're not there to provoke bitterness. They're not there to lord their authority over you, as some do. It says they're not there so that they can abuse their position for themselves, for their gain, for their own prestige. But they are there to serve Christ. And so they serve the Lord as his, his shepherds in the Lord, leading by example. This is under shepherds. As those who have been entrusted by God with you. With your spiritual growth. God has given them the responsibility and the insight to give you instruction, he says in verse 12. Nuthateo. 
Not just the facts, though. To give you an understanding mind. Literally, it means to put sense in your head. To take the truth of the Word of God and to show how it applies to our life, to our situation, to our problems, to our sin. So that God can use that truth to change the course, change the direction of our life, to change us for eternity. Shouldn't we appreciate men like that? Men that God has placed in front of us, in our path, for our benefit? So get to know them, Paul says. Get to know their heart. And then follow them. Follow their faithfulness. Follow their example as they follow Christ. And verse 13, he says, consider them worthy, not perfect, but men of integrity, so that you esteem them, hegiomai. So when you think about them, you have good thoughts about them. But go beyond that, Paul says. Regard them very highly. Huperek pirisu. Over, above, care about them beyond all measure. In love, agape, with the kind of love that Christ had when he sacrificed himself for us. Care about them like that. And why? Why should we do that? He says, because of their work, their ergon, their behavior, their, their commitment, their actions. Because of who they are. As they labor among us. Like a mother. Who would care for her children. And like a father who would instruct his sons. And his daughters. So that they might have joy. As they see that you are walking in the truth of his word. Their work has been ordained by God. And they have been placed there for your benefit, for the benefit of God's people, for the benefit of those who don't know Christ. And so it has eternal value. And though there may be misunderstandings along the way, and problems, and difficulties, Paul says this in verse 13. Don't let that get in the way. Live in peace with one another. Erenuo. Let your life bring peace to the situation. To your conversation. Don't bring strife. Don't bring division. Don't bring a bad attitude. Psalm 34, 13, and 14 says this. Let your tongue cease from speaking evil. Let your lips stop speaking lies. Depart from evil and do good and what? Seek peace. Pursue it. The psalmist says, hunt it down. Chase after it. It takes work. It takes time. But make it the priority of your life. To let go of the bitterness. Let go of the unforgiveness. And if possible, Paul said in Romans chapter 12, if possible, as much as it lies within yourself, as much as it depends on you, without compromising your faith, be at peace with all men. Build each other up. Don't tear down the work of Christ. Don't tear each other apart. And so Paul says in verse 14, we urge you, brethren, parakaleo, we appeal to all of you, brothers and sisters, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the one who has died for you, the one who has called you, called you by name, called you together 
as his people. Because of what he has done. Set your house in order. There are people in the church who need help. So Paul says, admonish them. Nuthateo. Same word used back in verse 12 that was translated as instruct. So he says here, give understanding, give instruction. He adds a thought, give correction to those in the church. Even weeping for them, for fear of where their sin is taking them. So he says, come alongside of the unruly, of the uh, atakos, of, of those who are out of order, out of line. It was a military word. It was used to describe someone who had broken ranks, someone who was out of control, like an unruly mob instead of like a well-disciplined army. So talk some sense into them. Warn them of the danger that they are in because they are on a path that's taking them in the wrong direction. And if they continue on that path, God will discipline them. God will chasten them. And if they continue, they will continue to dishonor him and to hinder the work of Christ. Why? Because of their stubborn, self-centered, self-seeking attitude. And as we think of them, don't we sometimes feel that weight? The weight on our heart? Because no matter how many times we speak to them, no matter how many times we talk to them, they just, just won't respond. And they won't abandon their their behavior. And they bring grief to us. They bring grief to God. They bring grief to his church. And then there are those, Paul says in verse 14, that we are to encourage. Paramotheomai. We are to comfort them. We're to build them up. They are, he says, the the faint-hearted, the oligosukos in Greek. Those with a small heart, small spirit. Those who are overwhelmed by their circumstances, by their situation. They may lack the courage. They may lack the conviction. They may lack the faith. They're always worried. They're always confused. They're unable to think straight. Sometimes they just can't see past their problems, beyond their problems, and see Christ. They just seem to always live on the edge of depression and fear. And there's very little joy in their lives. So, Paul says, we need to come alongside of them. And we need to let them know that we are there for them, but more importantly, that Christ is there for them. That he'll never leave them. He'll never forsake them. He will help them to rise above their difficulties. Then there are those in the church, Paul says in verse 14, that we are to to help. Anteko in Greek to firmly hold on to, to grasp, to assist. Assist the weak, he says. The asthenes, those who lack spiritual strength. That's what the word means. Those who are always battling sin, always battling it, but never able to gain victory over it. Those who have a a weakness, but it is a a spiritual, it's a moral weakness. They just can't seem to let go of their sin. It's the same word that's used in James chapter 5 verse 14, where it is translated as those who are sick. 
But it's not so much a physical illness, though that certainly could be part of it. But it is more a spiritual illness. And that passage in James says that uh, if anyone is sick among you, that is, caught in the web of spiritual weakness... Let that person call for the leaders, call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over that person, anointing that person with oil, lifting that person up to the Lord. He's the one who can help. And those men, those men with spiritual strength, as they pray for that one in spiritual weakness, something happens. God hears, it says. God hears them. As that person confesses that weakness, that sin. And it says the Lord will forgive them. And raise and restore that person. So we are to pray for those. The spiritually weak. Pray for them. Pray with them. We're all so different in the body of Christ, aren't we? Hmm. We find ourselves somewhere. We all are different personalities. We all have different problems. Different needs. Different, different points, different places in our maturity, in our walk with Christ. And so Paul says in verse 14, we need to be, to be patient. Makrothomia in Greek means long tempered. What would we say? With a long fuse? We need to be patient with each other. He says with all men. How? The way that Christ has been patient for us. In his long suffering towards us. He has dealt with us in kindness. That is how we are to deal with everyone else. With a long fuse. Long temper. In patience. And that's not always easy, is it? Because when we're, we're slandered, or when we're ridiculed, or when we're maligned, even within the church, even by those who claim to know Christ, can hurt. And what's our first reaction? Paul says our first reaction shouldn't be to think about taking revenge. See to it, he says, in verse 15, that no one among you repays. Apodidomai, uh, gives back, returns. To another person who has wronged you, the harm that you have experienced because of them. Don't retaliate against them, he says, with evil, for the evil that they have done to you and to the Lord. But instead, he says, have the mind of Christ. Have his attitude. That's the attitude that we're to have. Always seek after, he says, Dioko, keep on pursuing, chasing after that which is good and right and kind and pure, just like Christ. Pursue that which is good with love and with Concern, he says, for one another and for all men. As Christ lives in us and through us. And his attitude is seen in us. His life will be evident to God and to those around us. That is the attitude that we are to have. You've been 
listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.